acres in mid-Manhattan, from Rockefeller Center, come the voices, the opinions, the news of a nation. America speaking by leased wires, cables, wireless, to hundreds of millions of readers, blanketing a continent through the 146 stations of NBC. Condensing, elaborating, illustrating a war world's crises. Cables from Chongqing, edited here at Time. America speaking in books from Simon & Schuster, through magazines with teeming circulations. From Rockefeller Center, greatest news and entertainment disseminating capital, oasis of steel and limestone grandeur that sprang from a near slum. It was July 31, painful decade, depression era, when the first steam shovel bit into three forlorn, deteriorated, shabby blocks. When 5,000 men began to blast and hack and cart away a million tons of earth and rubble. Oh, we needed, heaven knows, the employment that the architects presaged. It was time for a bold stroke. But as the project began to sing and soar, depression panic cynics wailed, whatever in a world gone broke will come of it. Well, when 75,000 workers were through, this came of it. This titan of the skyline, the RCA building, this home of radio, architect's dream of functional power, this and 13 other great structures designed as a unit, as a balanced whole, with gardens, vistas, space and light harmoniously utilized. Even the wisest of insects, the bee, goes right into business among other great industrialists. Interrogate any given bee, and he'll vow he's living in the country. Obviously, he is. Just a bee's flight from this great upper concourse where successive flower crops tell the time of year. Here, Atlas vies with the International Building. British and French buildings, friendly neighbors, are joined by the channel. Looking across at them, the 67-year-old St. Patrick's Cathedral of Gothic grandeur sees what 20th century man has wrought from sweat and steel and stone. Here centers a cinema empire. Here the most palatial movie house on earth. Capacity, 140,000 patrons a week. Its sister, the center, an equally lavish home of operas and dazzling ice shows. And the show house of world drama. On Rockefeller Plaza, many a centerite recognizes the man responsible for all this, John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Thirty thousands work in this 12-acre, 14-building domain. Every day, visiting throngs equal to the population of Grand Rapids come gliding up the escalators from the subways without creating the slightest congestion. The building directories could be pages from a who's who of commerce. Great airlines favor the super modernity of the center. Here, Eddie Rickenbacker deals with traffic problems of the skyways that he has watched encircle the world since his ace days of 1918. Yes, the center is a magnet for great transportation companies of all categories, and the magnet for such ceaseless droves of sightseers and tourists and students from all over this hemisphere that a large staff of guides expounds the message and meaning of its scores of symbolic murals, allegories of world history. This artist's vision of new frontiers dramatizes man's progress toward civilization. When you go from arts to sciences at the center, you go to the world of tomorrow's aircraft. 
Now you can buy anything from an airplane to English pipe mixtures here. Your gift shopping can include a Swedish item or something unbottled from Scotland. Some exotic bouquets from the Orient. Or, say, a yellow-throated warbler whose ancestors migrated from the Canaries. Twenty-four restaurants in these dozen acres. The gastronomic gamut runs from buttermilk to artichokes hollandaise. From the Netherlands to the nether regions, 20 feet below the street. Here, opposite a characteristic London grill, is a cafe typical of a free Paris. Here, too, is New York's loftiest cocktail lounge, 65 stories up. Adjoining it is the glamorous Rainbow Room, unused now except for formal functions, official dinners, and for a dizzying, heavenly view of the world's most jam-packed island. So this is the face the center presents to the world. But what are the hidden facilities serving behind its bright facade? A special atmosphere here. Eight huge air conditioning plants like this compose the greatest system of its kind in the world. An engineer at this control can tell the climatic score in an office or a studio a quarter of a mile away and dispatch a mountain's effort to attack the city's humid swelter. Deep down in modern catacombs, machinists keep vigil against any mechanical breakdown. Carpentry shops saw and hammer incessantly at repairs and improvements of tens of thousands of offices. Three locksmiths give their full time to keeping the center keyed up. A whole brigade of vacuum cleaners breathes up the dust each night. As for the center air force, well, there are 15,000 windows. Down an arterial ramp go all supplies, all freight for all 14 buildings. And this unique branch post office, greater than many a sizable cities. The elevators which climb the RCA building travel at 1,400 feet a minute, can cover the zooming run in 37 seconds. Going up. The man-made peak these lightning conveyances take you to is the three-deck promenade, 70 stories high where you can see 50 miles on a clear day. Look down on the nation's most influential shopping street, Fifth Avenue, and the emerald patch of Central Park. And follow the course of Henry Hudson's majestic river climbing toward West Point and Albany. And if you're very lucky, salute the Queen Mary. And pay your respects to Al Smith's Empire State, world's tallest structure, 102 stories. On the other hand, you may be interested in a smattering of rockets, perfecting their form on the roof of the most magnificent motion picture theater on Earth, the Music Hall. Yes, these are the pampered princesses of precision. World's champs at subtle timing, supreme at assorted sports, internationally toasted for terrific taps. stage life of this celebrated troupe is unprecedented in the show world. Rockettes have comfortable rest quarters, may stay here overnight if they like. Their backstage realm is more like a college club than a show shop.
among these girls, there exists a genuine core spirit that has kept them on the crest for more than a decade, with thousands of enthusiasts who queue up in block-long lines. This foyer, by the way, is 60 feet, five stories in height. Here in the office of managing director Eisel, a future production is planned. Leon Leonidov and Russell Market go over sketches of the forthcoming spectacle to be performed on a block-wide stage whose semicircular proscenium simulates the sunrise. A scenic rehearsal in miniature by designer Bruno Main. In an extravaganza that will spread over more than half an acre, every item is placed and measured in advance in conjunction with Florence Rogge, director of ballet. Meanwhile, the most extensive theater costume department in the world is concerned with the goods of glamour. These two are artists who never take a curtain call, who only hear applause echoing from the wings. So the show draws near premiere, each ballerina's delicately sculptured stance, studied and styled by the choreographer and director. From an engineering viewpoint, the machinery which hoists the show into view is as fascinating as the foot-lighted product. What a contrast, this monumental hydraulic apparatus and the airy lightness of the graceful whimsies it silently serves. Now some folks get mixed up, call Rockefeller Center Radio City. This isn't strange, because the greatest radio establishment on earth sends news, drama, jokes, music into almost every American home almost every day. They show you a master control board and say, this is radio, but it's more. An inconceivable skein of wires and circuits, 140 stations in concert. It takes all these generators to supply the juice. It takes rheostats, infinitely sensitive, to measure and modulate the current. And for every technician, there are dozens of radio robots that duplicate manual control. Radio? It's a throng of actors shaping new techniques. It's the music of Bach, 200 years old, or Boogie Woogie. It's an endless chain of patient rehearsals for $10,000 shows lasting one night only. It's measuring a composer's tempo against an immutable allotment of time. It's hitting the second on the nose. It's timing a long concerto to end six seconds before a scheduled broadcast from Normandy. It's all these turntables recording every speech, every bulletin, every hour. It's a squeaking door or a galloping bronco a scream in the night. today, as everyone knows. Day after tomorrow, this is everybody's radio. Radio with eyes, television. Limited by the war now to simple demonstrations. Television, waiting impatiently to fling its visions around the world. Its first international show might most appropriately emanate, as a matter of fact, from Rockefeller Center, which wears on the brow of its proudest plaza the flags of all the allied nations, wears and honors them each sundown. Centers International. The consular officials of all our allies have headquarters here. 
Witness these ceremonies each evening. All nations of goodwill may claim a spot in these precincts. But most of all, this is a typical segment of a country that transforms the obsolete into progress and splendor. If anything ever was, this is America.